I want to say a word of welcome to you to First Young Methodist Church in Sweetwater. We're glad that you're able to be with us today and to watch along with us as we leave worship here. We uh, are in a time in which we know that there are so many things that uh, we can't do, but I want to tell you something that's never changed. God's grace is still active. It still moves with no constraints. God is not behind a face mask. He is not having to be sanitized. He meets us exactly where we are with all our dirt and dust and germs. And He loves us. So having said that, let me just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, you're welcome. And we invite you to enter into this time of worship with us. I want to say a few words about some things coming up. Uh, next Sunday, uh, if things don't change too drastically, we look to uh, try to have an in-person worship experience at our church. It will not be at 9 or 11, it will be at 10. Uh, we're going to be meeting in the middle in the Family Life Center. You will enter by the uh, doors of what's that street called? Summit Street or Miller Street? I'm the Family Life Center. Awesome. The back of the church. <laughs> if you need to have a handicapped accessible parking place, we will have parking roped off near there so you can park along the street. And um, we'll all need to come in that door. Um, you will be asked to sit in places that are socially distanced from other people. We invite you to sit with your family together if you have family. Um, but uh, we need to all keep our distance from each other in order to make this work. We're monitoring some numbers that um, uh, Hugh Kilgore uh, gave us a link to, and these numbers are the coronavirus cases in the counties of Tennessee. Right now, Monroe County is kind of by itself in a safe place, but we're surrounded by rising numbers around us, and even our numbers are rising a little bit. So uh, we want to continue to monitor those, and if, if for some reason those numbers spike, then we may have to put off that uh, day of reopening. But uh, I pray that we can come together. Several of you have said that um, you, you're not gonna be able to join us at that time due to your own uh, worries and fears about uh, getting sick, so I understand that we will continue to offer a live stream option so that you can watch it either uh, as it's happening or as it's archived later on YouTube, so uh, we'll continue to offer that. But uh, in these trying times, with all that we're having to deal with, it's just good to know that God is still with us. So we just invite you to continue to Pray with us, continue to look for ways that we can be in service to those around us and uh, continue to offer the love of Jesus wherever we are, even with the constraints that we have to work with. But having said that, I just want to say a word of welcome. And uh, as we worship today, let us focus exclusively on Jesus and on His goodness and His grace as the choir of the praise team leads us.
felt sure there for a second I was hearing angels. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. The um, time has come for us to lift up our prayers before God. One of the most important things I think the church does when we gather is pray together. I just feel like God uh, wants us to be together to pray. And so when we pray, I think He, uh, he hears us. We've got several folks we want to pray for. There are several on our prayer list. Uh, I spoke with uh, Allison Pigeon this week. She's been hospitalized and we want to continue to pray for her. There's other folks who are recovering from hospitalizations and surgeries and procedures and uh, each one of those is important. Folks who are grieving loss of loved ones. And then we had a good prayer request this morning. Uh, Jesse is with us this morning. He's our cameraman and it's a big day for him. He got to show us his learner's permit and that's a huge thing for a young man. So, um, uh, Jesse, if your mama doesn't let you drive, you let me know. I've got a long driveway and if Tammy's home, we use her car. And <laughs> But uh, I'll be glad to help you. But uh, we look forward to seeing how how he uh, do, uh, does with that. Uh, I tell a lot of parents, you know, just go ahead and figure there's going to be a little bump somewhere along the way. <laughs> just hope it's not a big bump. And uh, but uh, we do we do celebrate with you this morning. And um, as we go to God in prayer, continue to pray for all our churches everywhere. Pray for. Uh, our nation and our world. Pray that uh, uh, this coronavirus will settle down and be, be something that we can get uh, a handle on and begin uh, finding a way to live uh, normally once again. Let us go to God in prayer at this time. Gracious God, the whole earth is filled with your glory. As we come before you today, we come with thankful hearts for the many ways that you have blessed us. We thank you that in spite of all that we're limited about, there are still many ways that we're free because we're still free to pray to you. We're still free to open your word and hear from you your love and your goodness. We thank you that we have the opportunity, hopefully within a week, to open our church once again to in-person worship. We pray that as we do that, that we'll begin to see some sense of things returning to normal. We also pray for our schools, pray for our businesses, pray for our community, our state, our nation, and our world. We pray for peace. We pray for an end to violence war, hunger, and disease. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will be today with those that we know need a special touch of your grace, those struggling with illness, those recovering from procedures and facing surgeries down the road. For those who are grieving the loss of people they have loved. And for those who are seeking help for life's challenges. These and all others we bring to you and lay at your feet for you to touch them with your grace and your comfort and your love. Lord, with thankful hearts, we look forward to the blessings that you'll bestow upon us in the days to come. And 
We ask that you would receive our prayers as we make them in the name of Jesus. And as he called us, so we are bold to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading for today is Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and 36 through 43. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
pretty sure I heard those angels again. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Crystal for reading our scripture. When I asked her to read scripture, her response to me was, Oh, I love to read scripture. And I knew that I had hit the right place. So I'm appreciative of that. Appreciate uh, the ministry of everyone who takes part. I've seen a lot of different volunteers coming and doing things uh, through these weeks that we've been um, recording the service. So I uh, really appreciate everyone that does any part of this. And uh, I hope that uh, God will bless it. Well, let's bow our head in a moment of prayer. God, we thank you for the good seed that you keep sowing. And we pray today that it may fall upon the good soil of our hearts and produce fruit abundantly in our lives that will give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm sitting there for a few minutes thinking about the Reverend Ken Pfeiffer. You probably don't know Ken Pfeiffer. He was, he's now gone to glory, but Ken was known in Holston Conference as the pastor who knew the chicken jokes. And I don't remember all his chicken jokes, but I do remember one. He had one that he loved to say, uh, why does the chicken cross halfway across the road? And the answer is because she wanted to lay it on the line. So uh, I'm not going to lay it on the line today, but I, I do want to think about this very interesting scripture that talks about wheat and tares or good seed and weeds. And so we're talking about grace in the wheat patch today. As we think about that and think about uh, Jesus teaching to the people that came to listen to him so many years ago, that was a culture that was very dependent upon agriculture. So to talk about sowing seeds was something that would have been very common to a lot of people because their lives revolved around the cycle of sowing and reaping and harvesting. And so they would have immediately known what he was talking about. Those of us who live in the southern United States know that uh, there is some noxious weeds that grow throughout the south. In fact, there's this vine called kudzu. If we could figure out some money-making way to deal with kudzu, we would just let it grow. But it, it takes over and sometimes can grow three and four feet overnight. And so in the summertime, we see places where kudzu is growing and choking the life out of trees and weeds and all kinds of things. And if left to itself, I'm sure there's places where if uh, traffic didn't go by, certain roads, kudzu would just enclose the road, shut it down, and uh, it would be no more. So Jesus knew about the power of weeds, and he talked about someone who went out and sowed their field with good seed and went to sleep with good conscience. Have you ever had one of those sleeps where you just immediately hit the pillow and you're asleep? And you sleep all night and you don't wake up until dawn. I miss those nights. <laughs> While he was asleep, someone snuck into his fields and planted weeds. Of course, you didn't know it happened overnight. It had to take a while for the weeds to grow and begin to choke out the good seed. When his servants came and asked him what to do about it, they said, should we go and start trying to pluck the weeds out? And he said, no, leave it alone. We'll sort it out at the harvest. Let them grow together. So Jesus paints this picture 
that he later tells us is about God and how God views the world. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a world where everything was good and there was no sign of evil? But that's not the world we have. God allowed evil to be a part of our world. I think partly in order to bring attention to the fact that He is working to bring about good. If we just assumed everything was good, we wouldn't need God to give it to us. But because evil exists, we know that God can help us overcome it. And we can trust that God is the source of every good and perfect gift. And God continues to sow good within our world within our hearts and lives. Over the past few weeks as we've been quarantined and sheltered in place and as we've been dealing with the effects of the coronavirus, we've seen our world kind of come unhinged. I do not believe some of the things that we have experienced would have happened if we had not been in this situation wouldn't have happened quite to the intensity that it has. But when you tell people they have to stay in the house for week after week after week, the parents now have to teach their children at home, and that, just two or three days of that <laughs> probably wreaks some havoc in our families. But it set us to a place where we're a little quicker Become angry. Aren't you glad to know the Bible talks about God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love? Don't you think sometimes there's things that we do that irk God and yet He's slow to anger? Sometimes we think, I wish God would just bring an end to the things that we're suffering through. Why doesn't He show up and dramatically end it all? Well, if we live long enough, we might see that. But one of the things God is doing is allowing the good and the bad to grow up together in the hope that the bad may learn from the good. Now that can go the other way. I'm keenly aware of that. When my son was new in our home, we had to deal with the fact that the state of Tennessee was in charge of his education. And because of some issues that we're not gonna talk about, uh, they decided that it would be best for him to be in what they call a behavior modification class. How many of us know what a behavior modification class is? It's like church. Church is behavior modification. <laughs> but it's a little more intense. And they asked me my opinion about putting him in there. I don't think they were going to weigh my opinion at all because they obviously made a decision based on their opinion and not mine. But they did ask me my opinion. And if you ask me my opinion, I am free to give it to you. And so what I said to them was that I thought it was a mistake to place him in that setting because it would be a, quote, petri dish of moral degradation, unquote. <laughs> and the teacher who was writing down my remarks said, how do you spell that? <laughs> and I thought, you're teaching school. You should know how to spell that. Uh, my words tended to be a little prophetic because what I was saying was I felt like if he went into that setting, he would learn more bad things than he would learn good things. And that's exactly what happened. And it took us a while to kind of do what my mother said. My mother had a saying. Now, I'm going to quote her if you have trouble with this saying, I'll give you her phone number. 
she would say to us when she was growing up, she would say, I'm going to jerk a knot in your tail. <laughs> now, sometimes we need to have a knot <laughs> jerked in our tail. And I think God has the ability to do that. And sometimes we'll do that. But I'm thankful for the fact that He also has an awful lot of grace. And He lets us get ourselves in trouble. But He also teaches us a better way. Do you remember the words of the Apostle Paul? Who in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians ends that chapter by saying but I will show you a more excellent way. And then chapter 13 comes up. What's it all about? Love. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging symbol. And he goes on to say, there's three things that abide faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of them is love. God has given us the example of what we're supposed to have. But we continue to grow up in this patch among weeds. Sometimes we can have the very life choke out of us and we end up going down the wrong path. I think all of us were upset when we saw the videos of George Floyd who we didn't know anything about. We don't know George Floyd. But when we saw him suffering under what appeared to be a brutal way of dealing with him, we were reminded that there's times when bad things happen to people. Now, if we did a study of George Floyd's life, we might talk about some habits that he had that weren't the best George Floyd might have been in one of those behavior modification classes. I don't know. Might have needed to go to one. But he died because someone who was in law enforcement decided to hold him down by the knee against his neck for eight minutes while he screamed, I can't breathe. That has become a rallying cry for a resurgence of anti-racism in our country. I really thought we were at a place where we had learned an awful lot about racism and had begun to forge a different way of life. And I think in many ways we have overcome a lot of things But as we've been reminded by several voices over these past few weeks, there's still things we need to overcome. And it goes both ways. I had a friend when I was in college, I played the organ for a little church in Glade Spring, Virginia, so that I could get enough money that I could put gas in the truck so I could go back and do that again. It's about all the money I got. But while we were there, the, the man who really arranged for me and a friend of mine to go and do music ministry in that church, uh, he had heard of someone in the community that wanted to sing in the choir. She lived right behind the church. It was a little Presbyterian church. And up on the hill, behind a fence, was a neighborhood where 
where African American people lived. And just beyond that fence was the little Ebenezer United Methodist Church. Ebenezer would probably have fit four or five times in our family life center. Small church. She was a member there. They had eight members on the roll. She had a couple of nieces that she wanted to give the opportunity to experience a little more with music and church life. So she asked if she could bring her nieces and all three of them joined the choir. This was in 1983, I believe. And while she and the man that had invited us to do music were in the fellowship hall of the church, we had gone into the sanctuary where we were going to provide choir practice time and some of the members of the church very urgently circled us up and said, you're not going to let this go on, are you? Me and my friend, who's originally from over at Carnes, said, what do you mean? You can imagine what they said. They described the situation in some racist terms. And we were young and dumb and full of bubblegum. I just, we just didn't have any sense hardly at all. But we answered what they said with this. We had just begun ministry. <laughs> we said, well, if they're not welcome, we're not welcome. And you know, God bless that. <laughs> we didn't know what we were saying. It upset some of the people of that church. But they were willing for us to continue to do music. And they were willing to try to be hospitable to some people who look different from them. And I don't know if you know about choirs and choir music and things like that, but if you get a good alto, you're in good shape. <laughs> and Mrs. Lockhart, who came with her nieces, was an excellent alto. And she sang in that choir the rest of the time that we were there till we graduated. I went on to seminary and I had to take a required course in seminary in black church studies. And I took my pen to a piece of paper and I wrote Mrs. Lockhart one day and I said, I remember the times that we had together at the Grace Presbyterian Church and I just was thinking about you. I'm taking this course down at Duke and this is what the name of it is and this is what we're learning. And I'm so sorry that white people have been ugly to black people over the years. Signed, Brad Scott. She wrote me back. Beautiful, gracious letter. I've still got it somewhere. And she said, you know, you're right that white people have been bad black people, but if you think for one minute that black people aren't evil too, let me set you straight. This is something that I think we need to come to terms with in the United States of America. Yes, black lives matter, white lives matter, red lives matter, brown lives matter. All lives matter. And every one of us has the potential to do evil. Every one of us, regardless of the color of our skin. Because there's one common denominator in us, and that is every one of us are human beings. Made in the likeness of God, but fallen because of sin and in need 
of the redeeming power of Jesus Christ to remake us after His image. So we find ourselves living in a weed patch. Trying to do good. Wishing evil would depart. It's God's will that it stay with us so that maybe some of the good will rub off. Maybe we can show others the love of Jesus Christ in ways that is redemptive. Ways that will help others come to know the fullness of the love of God. One of the things that we deal with in times like we're going through right now is a lot of fear. Fear is prevalent in our society right now. What if we become a cashless society? What if we become a racist society? What if we run out of food? What if we catch coronavirus? What if we can't have college football? Fear on every hand. Can I tell you what the Bible says about fear? It says, perfect love casts out fear. If we are to be the disciples of Jesus Christ that He has made us to be. If we are to be the good seed in this world, we must trust in the power of Jesus Christ to change us. Imagine the most evil person you know. Imagine what it would be like if the love of Jesus came down on them in such power and such authority that they became convinced of the redeeming work of Jesus Christ. We spend a lot of our time in fear. We don't have to fear anybody. We ought to fear the Lord. Doesn't mean be afraid of God. That means respect, honor, glorify, adore God. And if we do that, if we get that relationship right, all our relationships become better. I've mentioned this several times. This is one of my things I say a lot. Y'all will hear this a lot. I'll remind you of this several times. But one of the things that we learn from the cross is the duality of our relationships. The vertical line represents the relationship between God and us. The horizontal line represents the relationship between us and everybody else. If this one is right, this one's good. If this one's not good, this one may not be right. We've got to get that one. And this one will work out. Because God redeems humankind so that we can lovingly care for one another. God wants each of us in His kingdom. So we find grace even in this world where evil still exists. Day in and day out of your life when you read the papers and you hear the news and you see the things that are on social media, we're reminded of the reality of the weeds but there is a greater reality. And don't forget it. That is the God of love who casts out fear is still in this world. He's still active. He's still bringing about His kingdom. And He's not giving up. And He never will. 
So may you and I find grace in this weed patch where we live. And may we look forward to the day when the Lord of the harvest comes to make things right. Will you bow your head with me? God, we thank You that You are active in our world in spite of all the things we see and we hear that make us afraid. We thank You that perfect love casts out fear. And You, God, are perfect love. We thank You that You love us. That you gave Your life for us. We pray that we may hold on with faith Ride this thing out until the Lord of the harvest comes and sets right everything that's wrong. In your name we trust and in your name we pray. Amen.
think for one moment that there's anything in this world that God cannot defeat. He loves you and He loves me. And He came to set us free from the conditions and the effects of sin. As you go forth from this worship today, go forth in the freedom and the power of the name of Jesus. Face your fears knowing that there is one who casts out all fear and His name is perfect love. And may the blessing God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever. And all God's children say it.